Right, uh, welcome back, everyone. Uh, this is day two of the uh, Linux Security Summit, and uh, we had a very full uh, room here yesterday for those that are, are remote. Uh, we had to add chairs at the back, uh, so that's really good to see uh, the increased attendance. Uh, and today, the program will be similar in format to yesterday. We have um, BOF sessions at 4.10 uh, p.m. And uh, I think I'll just uh, once again ask speakers to repeat uh, questions uh, rather than passing a microphone around. Uh, so the first uh, talk, we'll just go straight into that. Um, uh, this is uh, a remote talk and it's uh, about code aware services in the service of vulnerability detection. Hello everyone, my name is Bartosz Zatter, I'm from Samsung Mobile Security Team and today I'd like to tell you about various tools that could improve the security assessment process of a large-scale software system. So a few words about myself, I spent the last 15 years in various jobs in mobile product development where I found out that I'm really passionate about creating tools that uh, improves the productivity of software engineers and the software development process in general. So a few years ago I moved to security team where and I took a task of making a life of security engineers easier. And today I'd like to tell you uh, about some results from this challenge. And more specifically, I will tell you about the Code Our Services system, in short CAS. So this CAS is a system that provides insight into how a software product is made. It can also be used to automate software source code related operations. So it's composed of two parts, each part creating database of useful information, so the first part is a built awareness service and it creates a database of a built information. And the second part is called the function type database and it creates a database of a code information extracted from the original source files. So what I'd like to show you today is to how it can be useful in a software engineering job, especially during the automation of vulnerability detection. Okay, so here we have a very short glimpse at the entire system. I will talk about uh, each part of this system in details in during this talk. Okay, so let's now focus on the first part of the system, the Build Awareness Service, the BAS in short. Okay, so what kind of problem are we facing here? So imagine you need to do a security assessment of the mobile phone. The company you work for actually produce this phone, uh, so you can access, you have access to every source code that you need. So you download the source code from the repository and, you, and the first surprise arises at this point because, uh, because the entire software stack that runs on today's smartphone is extremely large. So for example, for the latest AOSP uh, x86 version, when you download the sources from the repo, you end up with around 1 million files. Of course, you want to focus on the low-level native part of the operating system, uh, mainly the C and C++ files, because the large number of issues uh, originates in the memory corruption problems, and uh, C and C++ uh, actually helps you very much in this regard. So, but we still have uh, more than 300,000 files uh, to review. So the complication is really huge. We have a few thousand modules uh, created during the build, I mean, libraries and executables. And another problem is that you can build many distinct products from one source tree or a different variants of one product. So actually only a subset of all the source files are actually used to build specific configuration. And the final complication is that you have a preprocessor definitions and of course inside the source files you have a conditional inclusion of sources based on these preprocessor definitions. So that means that actually a different parts of one source file can be used for two different build variants. So how could you know uh, if the code you're looking at is even running, right? We want to avoid the worst nightmare of security engineer. I call it almost CVE. So you, you spend the entire day by reviewing some function. You thought you find some uh, error in the code. So you create the POC, you uh, push it on the device, you run it and only to just to find out that uh, your code is not, has not even been compiled. Okay, so how could you know which parts of the source code are actually used in a given configuration? So, well, 
the build process uh, is able to create the final image that you can flash, you can run, and it, and it even works, right? So the, all the information that you need uh, is actually embedded in the build process itself. So what kind of information is that? Uh, which source files are compiled? Exactly how they are compiled? What are the dependencies between build files? Uh, information about custom tools uh, executed during the build, like for example, some tools that actually create some source files, uh, auto-generate them, etc. So actually all we need to do is just to track the build and grab all the information that we want. Okay, so now there are two questions. Uh, what do we need to trace and how could we do that? So what do we need to trace? So probably we need to trace uh, all the files open during the build. So we need to trace the open family of Cisco's. We also need to trace uh, all the executed processes, which are the execv syscalls. And it also helps to track the pipe syscalls to catch uh, which processes exchange information between each other uh, using pipes. And how could we uh, implement the tracer? So we have the LD preload tree, but there are two problems with that. We cannot track the static executables uh, used during the build, so uh, these parts will not get any trace. And another problem is that the, uh, the LD preload tree can also be used by the build system itself. So those two will now clash. Okay, so another idea, the ptrace. And actually this works. The first version of our tracer uh, was based on a modify strace tool. So there was noticeable overhead, like the build, which normally took three hours, uh, could end up in around eight hours. But actually we could live with that. And we lived with that for quite a long time until we uh, bought these big servers and we quickly find out that the more cores you use uh, for the build under the S-Trace, uh, the slower the build was. So for 128 core machines, uh, the build hardly even completed. So I suspect there is some synchronization of all Cisco's from all processors inside the P-Trace system call. I'm sure some of you can uh, point out to me the exact reason why this happens, but anyway, we finally uh, switched to the Linux kernel tracing infrastructure, uh, the F-Trace. So the tracer was implemented as a Linux kernel module. Uh, so, so it tracks the required information inside the kernel and just write the data uh, to the F-Trace buffers. So overhead actually depends on the, what exactly the build system does. Uh, but on average for the full AOSP uh, build, uh, we had around 5% overhead uh, in the build time. So here's the bus BAS architecture. Uh, it's quite simple and straightforward. Like the tracer tracks the build and saves raw Cisco information to a file. It's then post-processed and saved in a JSON file, which can be easily accessed by applications. Of course, it can be also be stored in a proper database, if you like. And applications can use it uh, for any purpose they want. I just want to mention two more things about the architecture. Like the first one is the sum of the executed processes have special meaning, like for example, compilation commands. So uh, these are analyzed further uh, to extract additional information from it. Like for example, uh, preprocessor defi pre definitions defined on the command line or internal compiler preprocessor definitions or include parts used by the compiler, etc. And there is also functionality uh, of computing the file dependencies uh, between the built files. So, for example, for the VM Linux linked kernel executable, we can get a list of files uh, the VM Linux depends on. So it's actually a list of the source files or header files uh, that were used uh, to create the VM Linux executable. Okay, so let's see some examples. How could this help us in everyday work? So the first thing is that you could radically improve your code search utilities. And how to do it? Well, you can get a detailed subset of files that were used to create the final product. So, or a specific model like li library or executable. So uh, imagine you have this checkbox in your code search tools that you can of course search in the code normally as always, but when you mark this checkbox, it says that look only in the files that were used to build the product or look only in the files that are dependencies of some specific model. So for example, in the latest ASP3, as I mentioned before, you download 1 million files, but actually less than 200,000 were really used to build this product. And similar for the common kernel, like 80,000 files download, less than 25% used actually to create the VM Linux. And so you can see the examples of that searching for GPU string in the code search tools, 
entire ISP, there's a, around 10 times reduction in the number of results when you mark this checkbox. And another example would be a uh, improved IDE indexing. So why would we want the IDE, right? But it has really nice features like searching for symbol references inside the IDE or some uh, difficult macro expansions, uh, navigation to the source code easily, etc. So normally, even if you uh, take all the relevant files and just pull it to the IDE, you still get thousands of errors, like everything is marked in red. And why does it happen? Well, in order for the IDE to operate properly, it needs exact compilation switches uh, of all the commands executed, compilation commands executed during the build. So you can grab all the preprocessor definitions that were used. So here is some example of indexing the VM Linux in the Eclipse CDT IDE. Yeah, on the left side, we've just pulled all the source code or from the Linux kernel into the IDE. On the right side, we have the custom generated project description files for the Eclipse using the uh, build information. On the left, uh, we've indexed a lot more sources that are really necessary. And uh, we also have much more unresolved symbols uh, than on the right, which is the right side is almost perfect in this regard. So you can see radical improvement for the IDE indexing capabilities, which translates into a much better experience uh, when using the IDE. Okay, next example. Imagine we have very complicated build system that takes a few minutes uh, to read all the make files be even before the proper build starts. So the Android build system was like that in the past and now it's significantly better, but I'm sure you can still find uh, this kind of build systems in the wild. So you want to make a partial incremental build for some selective functionality you're currently working on, uh, say a few source files from one module. So with build information, you can easily generate makefile ninja build files, knowing all the specific compilation commands that were used to build this module or module hierarchy. But let's us uh, take a look at some more concrete example of that sort. So, for example, in order to perform a Clang static analysis of some module, you have to invoke a build of this module under the scan build tool. It then extracts all the com compiled files and performs static analysis on all of them. And the problem arises when you want to make a selective static analysis for a certain files only, say a few modules from a large build. So with build information, you can generate a proper make file with compiled commands just for these files, as in the presented example. So which allows the fine grain clan static analysis on a large uh, software tree. And finally, you have a nice service that allows you to query build information according to your needs. Like, for example, you're working on some issue in a specific version of a product and your infra have build information for every release software version so you can consult it when necessary. And let's take a look at some examples of the query that you would uh, ask to this service. Like, for example, getting a list of compiled files would use a specific header file. Or getting a list of modules that depend on some specific source file. Getting a list of preprocessor definitions, even either given by command line or uh, internal pr uh, compiler preprocessor pre definitions, which were used by a given during a given compilation. And another benefit is that you can write automation scripts in your infra that query the build information from the service and use it in some productive manner. So let's now focus on the second part of the CAS system called function type database the part which creates database of source information extracted from the original source files. Okay, so now we have build information and perfectly indexed IDE, so we can finally start our main job, which is the security assessment of the mobile phone. So let's think for a while, what does a security engineer do when he performs security assessment of the Linux kernel or another model for, the, for that matter? So the first thing to do is to locate the entry points. What are the entry points? Oh, it's some location in the source code where the data uh, from the user flows in. So it might be some Cisco interface, it might be some uh, network layer, uh, sockets or other hardware. And the second thing to do is to verify the implement the source that implements getting the data and further processing the data because the, there might be some errors in there and security engineer needs to find them. So how the security engineer uh, looks for these errors? 
Well, he relies on his experience and tries to find some vulnerable patterns in the code, like, for example, some buffer overflows. Yeah, but the problem is still the same. Huh? There's a lot of source code to be reviewed. Like, uh, for the Linux kernel with all the accompanying models, it can be easily more than 3,000 uh, source files to review. So, what we want to do is to employ some kind of automation to help us in this task. And one way to do it is to uh, take the code and adapt it for fuzzing, so it can automatically find crashes, which can reveal some security problems. But how to automate the security code review itself? So there's this idea. What if everyone that works with the code and have the willingness and capabilities to do that could write their, their own tools that operate on source code relatively easy in an, any language they want? So they could transform their own internal vulnerable pattern recognition mechanism into some more automated form that could also work at scale. So what would we need to achieve that? Well, it would be best if we have some parsed source code representation in a simple format that we could just explore easily. So how to do it? How can we extract features from the source code? Well, maybe you can write some regular expressions but probably you can write very simple regular expressions until the task becomes unmanageable. So maybe we can write our own parser. Yeah, but to write the parser, the first thing to do is to write the preprocessor because we want to uh, parse the, uh, don't, don't want to parse the original code, but the preprocess code. And this is also a difficult task in itself. But even if we achieve that, uh, we have to uh, face the very complicated grammar of C and C++. So, the reality is that you cannot write your own parser. But hey, there are some working compilers out there, right? So why don't we just use the parser from there? And as it turns out, there is something that we could use straight away, a Clang frontend for LLVM. And the beautiful thing about Clang is that it uses a collection of libraries to do various things. And it was designed that way just from the beginning. So the Clang compiler is just a driver binary that combines functionalities uh, from many different libraries and implements the parser and compiler. So there is one interesting library, uh, libclang frontend, which is an entry point uh, to the parser implementation. And everyone can use it for their own purpose. Like it's possible to write a small application that uses this library to parse the source code. And this library implements some AST unit class, which has the function called parse surprisingly, which takes the source code, the source file, and transform it into some parsed representation of the source. So what does it mean, parsed representation? How does it look like? So it's some sort of a tree, uh, call it abstract syntax tree. In other words, it's just a code representation in a tree-like form, a tree of nodes. And it's an equivalent representation, meaning uh, the source code can be generated back from the AST form. And each node in the tree is described as a C++ that implements uh, some specific functionality of the source grammar. So, for example, there is uh, one node class, declare expression, uh, which implements a referencing some variable in a C-like language. So, as I mentioned, it's a tree, so it's easy to walk. Of course, you need to write the C++ code that uh, will traverse the tree. So, for example, if you want to find some all usages of some variable x, you just need to uh, traverse the tree, find all the uh, nodes with the type of the clever expression and compare the name. If the name is uh, of the node is called X, then you, you got it. You found the usage of the variable X. Okay, so here we have some very simple code and it's equivalent representation in the abstract syntax tree. And the problem is that we still need to write some custom C++ code to traverse the tree and extract the required information from it. So how about we just write the code once, this will walk that AST, extract some interesting features and save it into the JSON file. And this is how the function type database is actually created. Like we have this clan processor that takes one source file, extracts the, the predefined information from it and saves the resulting JSON file. And you can do it in in parallel for as many sources as you want. Of course, you need to have uh, enough RAM to do it, to help you with that. And the, all the in intermediate JSON files are then combined into one final JSON file. And you can do it for actually for any combination of source files, but of course, the most sane way to do it is to do it on a mo module basis. That's it, that is uh, one JSON file per, per one linked module. 
And the rationale is that the module was successfully create, linked, so probably the combination of functions and features is uh, somehow reasonable. So what do we extract from the sources? So we extract some information about functions, information about types, global variables, and some initialization of uh, function pointer members of the global structure types. And one important thing to notice is that uh, only selected information is extracted from the uh, from the code. We don't save the entire AST because, and even if we uh, do selective uh, extraction and, and saving into the JSON, it still can get can get quite big. Like uh, it's normal that for the for the VM Linux kernel executable, uh, the JSON size is around few gigabytes. Okay. So let's take a look in more details at the data extracted from the source files. And here are some examples about the source code and some JSON representation. So in case of functions, we extract some name and the arguments of the function. Arguments meaning the name of the argument and the types of the argument. We also extract some function attributes like whether this is a variadic function or this is inline function, what is the linkage of the function, uh, source attributes of the function, a body, either pre-processed and the original body. We have some uh, literals like string literals or integer literals. We also have tains on arguments and call information. In case of call information, we save uh, the list of all functions that were called inside the body of the function, along with, with the uh, variables used in the argument expressions of the call. So with that information, we can just uh, build the entire call hierarchy uh, for a specific function. We also save uh, all the automatic variables created uh, inside the function body uh, together with the compound statements where it, it was created. And we also have some all references to uh, other global variables, other functions and types inside the function. And another thing we extract is uh, some expression information. Uh, like, for example, we grab information about the in indirection operator, otherwise called the dereference operator, and also some RI expression. And in that case, uh, we just save all the base variables used in that expressions and also the computed offset to the memory. And similar fashion, we save the information from the member variables, like some base variable for the member expression and also all the uh, member offset in the member expression chain. Similar to the offset of expression, and finally, we save the, save the all the variables used in the if statement, switch, loop conditions, and return. Okay, so in case of types, the information stored allows us to reconstruct the types afterwards. And this is especially true for the structure types. So what do we save is the information about members, like the names of the members, types of the members, member offsets, and the full size and layout of the structure. So even for very complex nested structures, uh, we can generate the type fully, and can generate fully the type definition and uh, with all the dependencies just by reading the JSON file. So of course, we also support all the building types, which is the mostly the size and enumerations like enum strings and enum values. And in similar fashion, we, we support array types, type depths, etc. And one interesting case is the initializers for function pointer members of global structure types. So for example, we have these uh, file operations variables spread across the source code of the Linux kernel. And the members of the structure are function pointers to a specific implementation for a given driver. So for example, we have the write, IOCTL, and MMAP handlers, etc. So now, uh, whenever these handlers are initialized statically with a function name, we just grab that name and store this information inside the JSON file. So for example, we can extract a list of functions that are actual implementations for various interfaces. And some of them may actually be an entry point to the kernel, uh, which should be a review uh, in the first place. So I just show you some examples of the uh, code and its JSON rep representation. And one important thing to notice about all of that is that if some information that we want is missing in the JSON, uh, the support uh, can be easily added to the client processor to actually retrieve this data. And the opposite 
It's also true if there's too much information that we don't use and the JSON is too big, we can just uh, sort of simply remove it and don't save it. So currently the extracted data is predefined, but I imagine the extraction can be implemented as, as customizable as possible by providing some scheme file, etc. So how could you use the JSON data in some productive manner to support vulnerability detection? So the first example uh, could be a security code review support. So imagine a system that could automatically extract a list of functions which implement the entry point to the kernel and present it into IDE-like manner. So we could have the original code, some pre-processed code, uh, diffs with the previous release or previous model or an other OS version, tiny information arguments, etc. So generally, things that make the security code review easier for the software engineer. So you could apply some heuristics that looks for potentially vulnerable patterns in the code and sort the functions with the uh, probab probability of error in mind. Some examples of the uh, heuristics could be a uh, usage of some dangerous functions on the call hierarchy and some cyclomatic complexity. So the rationale is that the, uh, the more complex the code, the higher probability of error in there. And maybe some memory usage patterns, like the more the code shuffles around data across different buffers, the more probable that there is some error along the way. And it, it would be good if we could implement our own recipes uh, for the entry point extraction. So for example, we have some driver that have very many different implementations for different uh, commands of the IOCTL and better deep down in the main IOCTL code. Uh, so you could just extract all the implementations and mark them as an entry point for the review. And also a nice feature would be to integrate output from some other tools with your function view, like infer from fuzzers or static analyzers. So you could have everything in one place uh, to help you in the proper review. And another potential usage could be uh, we could easily generate dictionaries for fuzzers like AFL by just grabbing the used strings on other literal values from the source code. It's all in the JSON file, so it's very easy to do that. And one of the hot topics these days is a structure-aware fuzzing. So what is this about? So when you have some complex structure for which a fuzzer generates some data to, uh, to fill it, uh, it can do a much better job when it knows the layout and the type of the members of this structure. So in the example presented here, we have a structure that contains a string, enumeration, and some floating point, floating point value. So we could set up a leaf fuzzer harness for it, and it takes some buffer and fills the instance of the structure and fuzz it, and we run the fuzzing session and we get the crushing input reach in little about 100 million executions for the specific seed. So can we do better than that? So well, we have this leap protobuf mutator that can take a protobuf description of the data and mutate it accordingly. So if this protobuf describes our structure well, the mutated data that fills this structure would be a much better sort. And as it turns out, it reaches the crash much faster. It needs around 3 million executions to do that. And okay, the mutations are slower, but there are much less of them needed to reach the crash. So in the end, uh, it, it, fuzzing is much faster this way. So the problem is that the preparation of the protobuf descriptions and writing the function that actually unpacks the data and fills the structure requires some substantial manual work uh, for each structure type. So remember, this is somehow contrived, very simple example. Like, and with detailed information, uh, type information from the JSON file, we could generate initial protobuf descriptions and also the code of the unpacking function uh, in the automatic fashion. So this generated code might not be perfect, like there might be some complications, like for example, in the structure, some members of the structure can point out to other members of the same structure. So it might still require some uh, revision and fixing by hand, but most of the painstaking jobs of preparing the protobuf descriptions for complex structures can now be uh, automated. And as a final example, let's now discuss one of the applications that we uh, developed, which nicely presents the usage of the function type database. And the application is called the auto of target, the AOT for short. So let's have a look what kind of problem the AOT project solves so we could better un understand how the JSON database can help us in this regard. So imagine 
you need to test a piece of software that runs on a custom hardware, which is very difficult to test. A good example of that would be a mobile phone, which runs a modem software, which implements connecting to the cellular network. And one of the functions inside a modem is probably a parsing messages incoming from the network. So how would we test the parser inside a modem? So maybe we could create a little mobile network, connect our phone to it and feed the messages from this network to the modem. We would force the modem to just run our parser function. And to achieve that, we need to set up a base station and uh, get the software that implements the required network protocols, etc. So it seems quite scary, right? And expensive. And even if we succeed in such a preparation, uh, the fuzzing would probably be very slow because we need to send the messages over the air and we have the natural limitation uh, in the throughput. So, and what to do in case of crashes, right? It's hard to debug on the target. Like, it's not that simple if you just take the, run the modem and take the modem and run it under the GDB, or there might not be sanitizers that would print us the beautiful messages with the location of a crash. And I'm not saying that this is a bad approach, right? The whole system testing approach is a perfectly valid approach. I'm just saying it might be very difficult uh, to pull off. So, and so if you're looking for some alternatives, ideas, one of them would be to do some off-target testing. So maybe you could extract the parser code compiled in a host machine, uh, the machine that you actually do most of the development, uh, might be some Linux or maybe other operating system, and you just have some executable that you could test on your development machine. And so we also could utilize some all the standard tools like the GDB, uh, we could embed some coverage information inside the executable. We have fuzzers, we have sanitizers, we have Valgrind or even symbolic execution, etc. And the parser is probably written in the pure C, so it doesn't depend on the hardware very much. So maybe it's a, a feasible approach to, to do. Okay, so let's assume we want to extract the code for the off-target testing. So we just copy the function and try to compile it. And probably it fails because there are some missing dependencies. Uh, so you just pull more code, like more types, other functions that were referenced as more global, the treta, and repeat. And you probably do it many times until it finally compiles. And the problem is that for complex systems, this process is not, not scalable. Uh, it's pretty common, especially in the Linux kernel, that for these dependencies I just mentioned might be really, really huge, like for example, for, for some Linux kernel, you can easily end up like pulling one third of the kernel code uh, for some functions. And this is where the code information comes in. So the IoT project was developed to automate this task of extracting the off-target code. So that's why it called, that's why the project is called automatic off-target. So you can visit the GitHub page of the tool for more information, but the main point is the AOT project reads solely the JSON data from the function type database and operates on it exclusively as it has all the information that you need about types, functions, globals, etc. And another example, all is up to you right now. So one thing I'd like to achieve with this talk is to just show you what we did, maybe some get some feedback from the community. And I'm pretty sure there's a lot of people who is much smarter than me who is now watching this talk. So maybe you can come up with some other clever examples how to use it. So to summarize, all we've been talking until this point is just a software that runs on a mobile phone. But there's a much, much software out there, like uh, we have the uh, other operating systems, we have the car industry, we have games, etc., etc. So for example, in the Ubuntu uh, 2004, there are more than 70,000 packages in the repository and it constitutes almost a 600 million line of C and C++ code there. So the tools presented here uh, could be applied to the entire C code base ever created. And so far, uh, the function type database uh, works only for the C code, but the C++ implementation is on, is on its way. So at least for the C-like parts of the C++. And Finally, here are some key takeaways from this presentation I'd like you to remember. So uh, these could be uh, software systems are extremely complex these days and CAS can help you navigate through this complexity and it could improve your tools. 
and allows for more automation and this applies to all the software engineering jobs and especially the security verification of the low level code and it can be applied to the entire software code base ever created and you are the one that could find a new ways of using it so thank you very much for your attention and if you have any questions i'd be glad to answer all of them so just reach out to me in any preferred form of your choosing and hope to talk to you again